peoples and persons of all ages. It is I, Kazrium, and while making some progress on my longest ever essay centering around Luz, I thought I'd spend the final days of the year reflecting on an early resolution of sorts. In my last video essay, I took a stab at covering some of the top antagonists of the Emperor's Coven, and as fun as that was, I messed up because some of you may have noticed a noticeable absence in that video. And despite all the detailed evaluations of the foes that were there, I also completely neglected to tell you all the most important part about them and their role in a major Owl House theme, morality. So, how did this all start? Well, I was sitting back drinking a piping hot tea, Amity style of course, when I saw something that caused me to drop what I was doing and spill said tea. Like I said, I made a video highlighting how some of the antagonists from the Emperor's Coven compared to each other and eventually improved over time, thereby fixing one of the show's biggest fundamental flaws, which was a lack of central tension from antagonistic forces. Since this is a follow up, I'd recommend checking out that video before watching this one but hey, either way you're watching a video for me, so I'm not complaining. A lot of you saw that video and were thankfully very happy with it. However, I got a few more comments than usual, not necessarily critiquing the analysis, but uh, uh more... Okay, okay, yowza wowza, I'll talk about Odalia. And while I'm at it, I'll also talk about the reason why I didn't mention her. But before we get into that, my crystal ball of obsessive analysis needs time to find the dark corners of this blight, and oracle supplies are not cheap. But thankfully, I can afford them thanks to this video sponsor, NordVPN. As someone with a network engineering degree, I can tell you from first-hand experience that even just browsing the web can give your ISP tons of data about you. But using a VPN like NordVPN keeps your data anonymous to your ISP and thanks to their network of over 5,500 servers across 59 countries, you can continue to use the internet just like before with no impact to your speeds all while staying protected. Speaking of 59 countries, we all know how painful it is to try to find a movie or show not offered on a streaming service in your region, only to hear of the glorious catalog of every episode of Amphibia on Disney Plus in the US, or the massive catalog of anime on Netflix in Japan. Well, thanks to NordVPN, you can change the location of your IP address and watch it right now with the click of a button. Wow, now I'm in Japan and I didn't even take a 12 hour flight to do it. For a limited time, you can get up to an additional four months of NordVPN for free when you click the link in the description or go to nordvpn.com slash and sign up for worry-free web browsing with NordVPN. And if you decide it's not for you, they even offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Anyhoot, while my crystal ball continues to explore the dark heart of this heartless tycoon, let's talk about that lesson I missed from before. But to do that, I need to address some issues that came up with that video essay. While I stand by my analysis of each of the characters, it's come to my attention that key elements of the video weren't totally clear to some people. Some of them were completely my fault, and others were well, things that didn't really fit within the context of the video, so I'd like to talk about them in greater detail here. Let's start with something that I messed up on though, and at its core, it has to do with context. The first being the use of the word villain in the video. Something that I ended up doing in the video but I didn't explain is that when I used that word, I was using it interchangeably with the word antagonist, and not for its literal definition which implies a character whose evil agenda motivates their actions. When I first saw these comments pointing this out, my initial reaction to this was, Irma Gerd, don't take it so literal, ah. and my second reaction was, yeah that's fair. Even though that the word evil wasn't said once throughout the entire video, and that I still believe that it didn't imply most of these characters were in the slightest, if that was the takeaway of a decent chunk of the audience, then that's on me for not making that more clear. I didn't establish this change of definition, and words should have meaning in an essay format, so I accept responsibility for failing to do so. Sorry for the confusion, I should've explained that. 
Another thing I should have explained is that I recognized that the show was cut short, leading to some less than desirable results on Terra and Lilith's storylines in particular. I mentioned it several times before in previous video essays, but I should have also mentioned it in that video because it was something that could potentially be viewed as a critique. In Terra's case, this is completely justifiable, and to be clear, did not negatively affect her ranking in any way. She scored just behind Hunter, after all. Just general disappointment that we didn't get more of her to no fault of the writing team, the character, or the show. That said, in Lilith's case, I do maintain they could have given Ida some hesitation on forgiving her sister, or at the very least had loose display that mistrust she talked about in Separate Tides just for an episode or two, even within the time constraints that they had. It's not the fault of the writing team for deciding not to explore that out of concern for time, though they definitely should have cut that line of loose saying it was hard to trust each other if they weren't going to ever address it again. But I still retain my opinion, considering keeping up appearances was in many ways Lilith Ida and Gwendolyn reconciling different aspects of their relationships with each other. They literally fight in that episode. Small changes to dialogue here and there would have actually been the perfect episode for Ida to finally forgive Lilith and even give direct context on why Lilith actually chose to curse her sister in the first place. Not some random quote from Bellos, but that she felt neglected compared to Ida as it was only implied in the actual episode and not thoroughly explored. Speaking of her redemption, as I stated in that video, I was solely focused on each of those characters' time as an antagonist, but that doesn't mean that I think that they're all bad people at heart. The point of that video wasn't to compile a list of characters in a hateful fashion, or as a point to discredit the work of this amazing show, but instead as a lighthearted discussion about how effectively each of them fit within their role as an antagonist during the time that they were, what did they add to the central tension or intrigue as a member of the main opposition, and explore how over time improvements to that role developed as a direct result of their own shortcomings, however small they may be. I get that some people are okay with or even prefer villains that are more funny than an actual threat, but considering the direction the show went in, establishing the danger the Emperor's Coven posed became increasingly important and what I felt made for more worthwhile screen time in the long run. But even as threats to the protagonist, for every spot with the exception of Bellos, an argument can be made that none of these people are actually evil, aka literal villains, but they're all just being deceived and misled by him. To that point, I completely agree, and would like to reaffirm that a character can still have good intentions and qualities despite being in an antagonistic role. That's just one of the ways you can make antagonists more interesting and beneficial additions to a show, which is, you know, the whole point of making a video diving into each of their psychologies. So for just one final thing before we get to Odalia, I'd like to take this opportunity to expand on the basis of each of my thoughts in this video, and use what we discussed in the main villains essay to show why all of this is so important that I dedicate almost two videos to it by now. It's because the duality between the antagonistic contributions and motivations of most of these characters ultimately form one of the biggest lessons the Owl House tries to teach their audience, and I can't think of a better character to break this down with than Lilith. My videos discussing Lilith thus far have been only referencing her time as an antagonist, so I haven't really had a chance to get my thoughts on her out as a whole before, but while we're here, Lilith's progression over the course of the show is one of my personal favorite character threads. She went from a standard defeat of the week type antagonist to a wholesome, lovable nerd, just trying to reconcile with her past by lifting up the people she hurt and moving against those she was hurt by. She's by far one of the most improved characters, up there with Amity in terms of how she treats others, and her friendship with Hootie is my favorite and most unexpected new dynamic introduced in Season 2. This is why I put such an emphasis on her past as a poor antagonist. It's key to what makes her a great protagonist. The growth of her humility is a shining example of how people in real life shouldn't be afraid to shy away from their past mistakes, but rather acknowledge them and make a point to do better in the future. You could say that she inspired me to make this video discussing my own shortcomings in my previous essay. Her development as an empathetic person is one of the best aspects to the core of her character, so you can imagine my concern when I saw some comments arguing that Lilith shouldn't be held accountable for any of her actions up to that point because Bellos misguided her. I'm gonna be honest with you all, I feel like saying that is a complete disservice to the incredible writing and progression that this character has had, and something that the show doesn't even attempt to imply. 
She may not be fully to blame, but she's responsible for at least some of her actions here. First of all, Lilith herself chose to curse her sister in order to get an edge. Even if Belos' words to the general public were what motivated her to do it, it wasn't, we just talked about that, sacrificing the well-being of her family is something that she decided to do in a decision that would have negatively impacted the rest of Ida's life even if the curse only removed her powers for a day. It might have been forgivable if Lilith had immediately taken accountability and told Ida she cursed her and why, but no. Instead, Lilith continued to profit off of and even looked down on Ida for years because she got to rise to the top and not her skillfully superior sister. And then, if that wasn't enough, not only did she completely ignore Ida for years, allowing her to suffer as an outcast of society and distance herself from everyone she knew and loved, but she disregarded her wishes to not join the Emperor's Coven to be healed and even attempted to physically force her into doing doing so, just so that selfish mistake that, remember, Lilith made could be rectified. I don't even know why I have to convince anyone of this. The show clearly points out that Lilith was at least somewhat in the wrong here and doesn't even attempt to justify her actions with Belos' deceit. Like, think about it, if Belos really did keep his word and healed Ida, does that make any of the years of lies and abuse towards her okay in the slightest? Think, commenter. Thankfully, though, that's not the final word here. Like I said, after Bellows did lie to her, Lilith is an example of someone who evaluated her past, recognized the damage she did, and took action to at the very least improve the life of her sister, regardless of who was mainly to blame. To me, that's what made her a unique and interesting addition of a protagonist to our already stellar cast. Not that she was viewed as a blameless victim of Bellos' lies like everyone else, but as someone who knowingly made bad choices, could accept her part of the blame, and do better by actively fighting against those perpetuating the things that she did. And when I say that maybe she shouldn't have been forgiven immediately, I'm not saying that she shouldn't have been forgiven at all. All, she changed for the better over time, not instantly, and even felt like she genuinely deserved to take more accountability for her part in Ida's suffering because of it. So with this in mind, making the argument that blatant abuse and child endangerment isn't worthy of at least a decent amount of responsibility because it was a justified means to an end is both a very concerning argument for someone to make and entirely circumvents a very special aspect of her as a character. That would be like saying Odalia shouldn't be blamed for her actions because in fact, Bellows lied to her about doing her a big favor in his new world. That totally excuses the abuse and manipulation Amity suffered through for years, and more recently, locking her up, destroying her treasure belongings, and attempting to separate her from her support system multiple times. It's all Bellows' fault because he misled her. So she, and everyone else, don't deserve to be held accountable for their actions at all. That may be an exaggeration, the intention is different, but I think you get my point. So why take all this time to highlight her growth and reaffirm her part of the blame? Well, because accepting and understanding these equally real aspects of Lilith, and to that point, most of the other antagonists and even protagonists are essential to that big lesson I was talking about. The Owl House wants its audience to know that people are rarely good or bad there's a gray area. We move within that spectrum of morality every day because no one's perfect. I chose Lilith to demonstrate this because she's someone who's previously erred on the darker end of morality, but was able to realign herself and become a better person. And just like her, the only one that can align ourselves within that gray area between right and wrong is ourselves. With how many of our antagonists were left how they were at the end of Season 2, I wouldn't be surprised if most, if not all of them, undergo the same soul-searching and realignment that Lilith pioneered for the show, and that's a good thing. Remorse and guilt can be tough pills to swallow, but by making these mistakes and truly wanting to make things right, you can make life better for yourself and everyone around you. It's not about if you're a good or bad person. It's about if you were a better person than you were yesterday. That's all to say that if you've ever felt like you've done something wrong by someone before, 
making bad decisions in the past should never stop you from doing the right thing today. But hang on, what's that I see? Oh yes, my crystal ball is all consumed with a blight, and you all know what that means. Oh no no, that won't do. They say the best salespeople could sell seaweed to Sulky Damas, and when I think of those people, I think Steve Jobs, Billy Mays, and of course, Odalia Blight. Odalia is someone we don't get to see a lot of, I mean she's a literal shadow of a character in season 1, and yet, backed by popular demand, we're talking about her. So what gives? How can one woman who has a collective screen time of less than 14 minutes all but consume the minds of thousands when the question of who is the best antagonist of the show is asked? Well, I'll tell you, for the low low price of a sub to the channel. Or just keep watching, but I'd appreciate it. Odalia is a lot like Bellos, where even though the character doesn't get much screen time, they represent a central point of importance for the show, so they're constantly being discussed by the more regularly appearing characters. Her masterful sales experience even emulates a similar pattern of manipulation as the Emperor. But whereas with Bellos, his main intrigue has more to do with his influence on the world of the Boiling Isles for everyone else, Odalia has a more personal effect with her actions. This shouldn't diminish her role as an antagonist though, she knowingly facilitated the construction of an army for the bigger baddies after all, but even then, that's not the main point of contention that she provides for the show. To talk about that, we need to talk about Amity. More specifically, the little Miss Perfect Odalia made her to be. Everyone always talks about her hair, but if you go back to I Was a Teenage Abomination, you can see many of Odalia's mannerisms in Amity. Even her speech pattern is more aligned with Odalia's snobbish tone, whether intentional or not, with it only breaking away when Amity is pushed to the limits of her patience. Amity didn't start out like this though. We see from a young age she gave resistance to the overbearing nature of her parents, and it seems that over time, Odalia pushed her harder and harder until Amity herself was convinced that the status of a blight was of utmost importance. What makes this significant is that it's Odalia's corruption that makes Amity's progression from when we first meet her to where she ended up such an interesting and heart-wrenching story to follow. Amity wouldn't be nearly as beloved of a character without this adversity from her mother, and it's her continued rejection of this idealized little Odalia that makes her soul searching that much more interesting as she reconciles with herself and becomes, in her own words, the kind of person I really want to be! So this is what keeps Odalia in the conversation, but wait, there's more. What about what drives her? I mean, why is she doing this? Well, if you thought Kiki Mora's intentions were bad, then boy do I have a deal for you. Odalia, being someone obsessed with status, has perhaps the unsurprising flaw of an insatiable greed emanating from her very presence. How greedy, you ask? Even when sales were through the roof, she didn't hesitate to knowingly throw the entirety of the Boiling Isles under the blade of a witch hunter for a very ambiguous offer that may have granted her a slight advantage over everyone else in this so-called utopia. I mean, Kiki Mora wanted power too, but this is a whole different level of letting the world burn beneath you. And in case if there was any confusion on if she was doing the wrong thing for the right reason, she justifies her actions by saying she does everything for the good of the Blight name, and yet, when push comes to shove, she's fully willing to abandon her ideals and even family in the event that things don't turn out the way she wanted them to. Like when she almost still expelled Luzon friends in Escaping Expulsion, despite the outcome being almost exactly what she wanted. All of this is to say that she's so unlikable compared to the other antagonists that she manages to wrap all the way back around to being one of the, if not the most popular, unpopular characters on this list. So why didn't I include her in the original list in the first place? 
Well, it's for a few reasons. For one, the video was focusing on the central antagonistic threat of the Emperor's Coven and its heads. The point of the video was to see how the Emperor's Coven went from a mild weekly inconvenience to an absolute world-ending threat to be reckoned with. They didn't really feel like the best and brightest witches in all the land until much later in the series, so I wanted to evaluate that and if you noticed, the list mostly goes in order of when they became a main threat of the show. Odalia isn't a part of that system. Sure, she supplies them with the weaponry, but Blight Industries is just a subsidiary of a coven and not one of the top dogs like she wants her family to be. Which is the reason she keeps forcibly pushing Amity to join the Emperor's Coven with the intention of her eventually becoming a coven head. Furthermore, that leads into my second main reason of not including her, and it's because her most interesting influence is as a driving force for the development of a separate character, rather than her role as an obstacle for the world of the Boiling Isles. I would have much preferred to go in depth with Odalia in a video essay talking about Amity, and I still will, but... Let's be honest, everyone hates her and wanted me to talk about her because of what she did to Amity and her family. Not because she was generally snobbish and supplied the Emperor's Coven with weapons. Again, the point of the list was to show the progression of the intricacies of the antagonist, not to be a hate-driven collection of characters. That said, for her managing to steal the spotlight literally for the short time she actually spent on the show, I'm placing Odalia as number 3.5 on the list. Her influence on a beloved portion of the show is strong, I like how the show didn't try to make her seem sympathetic or redeemable in the way that many other animated series would've, and above all, she's just so darn fun to root against, and that is a deal she can uphold. So there you go, sorry that took so long, hopefully you now have a better understanding of my thought process behind that previous video essay, and I can use that to make my future essays even better. In the meantime though, why not check out another one, like when I talked about the parallels between the best and worst episodes of the show, or an Owl House musical that is anything but ordinary. But whatever you do, don't forget to subscribe to join the Witch Appreciation Society. I've been Danny K, and remember to do something nice for yourself today. I'll see you all on the Hex Side.